uh, prioritizing the artist vision. That's cool. Luke, how did you feel about it? I loved it. And I, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, just kind of different uh, format and approach to, to a workshop. You know, I uh, believe I've strictly done more of the Iowa uh, approach, you know, so it was a, a different way of engaging the work. Um, and I think like Kevin said, you know, I, I had to think and, and be more like aware of it uh, than, and from different angles than I, I was, you know, used to and anticipating, I think. So that was very nice. It was a, a nice way to, um, you know, like you said, and like our goal is with it to have kind of a, a different approach and uh, a different angle with everything. How, how did the workshop work, Fong? How do you do it? Uh, so it's, uh, it's a variation of the critical response process, which actually has its origins in dance. And um, it, it's basically um, has four stages and it begins with statements of meaning. So there are responders who is everybody who, but the facilitator and the artist that, um, and the responders at that point talk about what things that are meaningful, uh, effective, uh, really enduring for them as readers. And then it goes to the artist as questioner, which is the uh, stage where the, the artist in question asks questions about their work. And, um, and then uh, the responders ask neutral questions of the text, and then we invite opinions at the end um, and, uh, and engaging sort of the, the artist's willingness and readiness to hear full on criticisms of their work. So, um, and my variation on that is that um, I have uh, the writers or, or other fellow writers summarize uh, their work at the beginning, and I asked them to talk about the origin of the story and the genesis of it. So, you may be on mute, Sam. With the neutral, with the neutral response, that sounds like it would be the hardest part. It is the hardest part, yeah. And it's hard. It's hardest to um, to ask questions without opinions couched in them, and that's something that um, everybody, uh, when they first start, they critical response process struggles with a little bit, so. Yeah, so what's an example of a good neutral question? Uh, well, the example that I gave is, um, uh, what does this character want? So instead of saying, um, you know, character, why does character A lack desire? You know, uh, you, you posing that question is more, in a more open and neutral way, is leads to a real investigation instead of defensive posture, so. Yeah. So you can't say, like, why is this story so excellent? Uh, I, I, I guess that's not neutral. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I like to say there's there's um, positive and negative ways to be dismissive. And neither of them are good. Right. So you can negative way to be dismissive is oh, I don't like stories like this, you know, or a, a, a positive way to be dismissive is I liked it. It flowed well. And that's yeah, it. it flows. Yeah. Yeah. And without any kind of um, more precise phrase. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds cool. I'm going to get more information about this from attendees, and we're going to be talking about some of this stuff on Tuesday in workshop, which I'm excited about. Um, okay, let's let's have a reading. Everyone, I can't see your faces because you're just little black squares. I can only see Polly, Kevin, Fong, and Luke. You don't have to show your face, Josh, but it's nice when you do. Hi, Leanne. Um, this is our first visiting writer event of the year, and I'm really stoked about it. I, it's I'm, I'm sorry that it's um, remote, but I'm really glad that we're doing it remote because otherwise I couldn't have had Fong here. So I'm really happy that we're doing it. Next visiting writers will be Laura Poets, Laura Reed, and Maya Jules Zeller. That'll be November 17th. And then I'm gonna get you the whole list of everything that's coming uh, next week. So you'll, so you'll know the next, I think five or six. But this is our first visiting writer of the year. And I asked Luke to prepare an introduction. He's gonna introduce Fong. Fun's gonna read for 20, 25 minutes, whatever it is. Then I thought we'd get into Q&A for a while because it's nice to have a, a visiting writer who's not only a really strong writer, but also a really strong teacher. And so somebody's able to talk about the writing with us as um, writers and readers and students. Um, so Luke, will you take over? Yes, thank you. Uh, so tonight we have Fong Nguyen, who grew up in Highstown, New Jersey, but has called Missouri home for the last 15 years. He teaches fiction writing at the University of Missouri, where he is the Miller Family Endowed Chair in Literature and Writing. He also teaches for the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing 
every other summer. Bong is a writer of historical fiction in his novel Bronze Drum, experimental fiction in his novel Roundabout, and improvisational fiction, spinoffs like the novel The Adventures of Joe Harper, alternate history, and his collection of stories, pages from the textbook of alternate history, dirty realism, and the story collection entitled Memory Sickness, and more. His stories have appeared in more than 50 national literary journals and anthologies, which means he is far too successful for me to name them all here. He has also edited volumes including Nancy Hale on the life and work of a lost American master and Best Peace Fiction, a social, social justice anthology. Fong believes we have control over what influences us and is a fan of method writing. Therefore, it's always good to know what he's currently working on before engaging with him. Uh, I can say from workshop today, it's probably something very pleasant. When asked about Joe Harper's voice, he said, as far as the experience of Joe Harper's voice taking hold and not letting go, this was the most powerful and enduring example of that phenomenon for me as a writer. But it must be said that I usually begin a story with a character's voice. He's also said, research is and always has been an essential part of my writing process. Some people write from life, others from dreams. I write from research. That said, I have to work hard to make sure I don't get carried away with the research and forget what is important, which is the story at hand. And with that, let's get to the story at hand. Fong Nguyen, everyone. Wonderful, thank you, Luke. I really appreciate that introduction. Thanks to Sam and Kate who's hiding back there. Um, good to see you. Um, so uh, what I decided to read, as uh, you could tell from Luke's introduction, there are a lot of, uh, there's quite a variety of different options in terms of genre and type. Uh, but I decided to read not from one of my published books, but from uh, a, a work in progress, uh, from a story collection called Senior Skip Day. And this story collection is uh, full of stories that are written in the voice of high school essays about canonical American poems. Um, and uh, I'm going to, just because they're, they're, you know, I've seen enough uh, Zoom talks where people are just sitting down and not really presenting. I've decided to stand today. And I've also to set up a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, not a presentation, a, uh, a PowerPoint, um, just so you don't have to just look at my face. Um, so I'm gonna, share that screen and uh, so you can look at so the, the story i'm going to read to you is actually called prompt for final essay and it's the last story in the collection so all the stories preceding it are in the voice of these high school essays about canonical american poems and at the very end we get to the prompt itself uh written by the uh the the, the teacher or narrated by the teacher of this assignment um, the book has an epigraph, which is from Mark Strand's poem, Eating Poetry, and it's ink runs from the corners of my mouth. There is no happiness like mine. I have been eating poetry. Uh, this particular story was published in Story. And uh, so that's uh, where I'll be reading it from. Uh, prompt for final essay. It begins and ends, of course, in this very prompt style. For your final paper this semester, you will be assigned a poem from the American literary canon. Write a 12 to 15 page essay in which you analyze the poem and explain how it relates to your life. Make sure you draw personal connections to your life while you analyze the poem. What makes this poem significant to you? As you write your paper, go beyond the obvious conclusions and write about what you see in the poem that no other reader would. For example, here is the poem in a station at the Metro by Ezra Pound. The apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bough. Whenever I read this short poem, I think about the year after I graduated college and moved to Brooklyn. I had a girlfriend way out on the other side of the country at UCLA where I had transferred because I thought I wanted to make movies, then traded up for New York City because I realized I wanted to make films instead. Her name was Dodger. Her parents were zealous baseball fans and the Los Angeles Dodgers had just won the World Series in 81, the year she was born. She spent the rest of her life making choices that were calculated to prove to friends and strangers that she wasn't a baseball fan, getting exotic piercings and Indian tattoos, wearing thrift store sweaters, generally cultivating the image of the brooding beauty that I would fall hard for when we met in Western civilization class sophomore year. 
She looked frail and perpetually tired with dark rings around her eyes and chaotic red black hair. Dodger was the most honest girl I'd ever met. She was painfully, meticulously honest. It was almost as though she were mortally afraid of dishonesty, like the whole illusion of life would fall apart if she let that smallest amount of duplicity in. Early on in our relationship, she told me that I was average in nearly every way, that I would never make it as a filmmaker. The extraordinary thing about me was that I had boyish enthusiasm, she said, which most people lose when they turn cynical at 16. It was the thing she loved most about me, she said, my excitability. I pretended to like the fact that she was so honest. If it made me insecure and self-conscious, did she really think of me in this way, like a hyperactive child? Then that was a small cost for what I was starting to think of as true love. I lived in a railroad apartment in Williamsburg when it was just another stop on the L train. Most of the money I made for my job as a receptionist, I spent on street food during my half hour lunch break or on my way to the subway after work, rent that was too damned high, and phone bills calling California and talking to Dodger about minor everyday things that somehow felt consequential. If I didn't have you to talk to, Eddie, she said, I don't know what I'd do. What do you mean, I said. I don't know what I mean, she said. Like, last week you got super excited about sauerkraut. Dude, it's just pickled cabbage. No, 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 you don't understand. The sauerkraut at the Polish market in Greenpoint is amazing. It's soft and crunchy at the same time. The brine is so delicious, you can just drink it. It's peppery and it's mustardy and, and, and you can't get it anywhere else. Don't get me wrong, I, I need that kind of energy in my life. Just don't let the city make you cynical like the rest of us. I looked out the window onto the street where at that very moment a unicyclist was passing by. Don't worry, baby, I said. This isn't a country boy goes to the city and becomes jaded by big city ways story. Yeah, it's a country boy goes to the city and makes it big as a receptionist story. Come on, that hurts. It's really an aspiring filmmaker, takes a decent job to pay the bills while putting his feelers out there in the industry story. Dodger could never indulge a fantasy. Her honesty compelled her. Silence was the best she could do. How about, she finally said, a Southern boy meets local Angelino, they fall in love, then Southern boy moves all the way out across the country, leaving the Angelino behind while he pursues his big dreams and the Big Apple story. That's not fair. You didn't have to take another year. Should I not get my master's degree, she said. Maybe I should follow you to New York. Then in a few years, we'll decide we want more nature in our lives. We'll move to the suburbs to become commuters. Then we'll get so bored, we'll start popping out a few kids. Then we'll get so guilty, feel responsible all the time. We'll forget whatever it is we wanted to do in the first place because we're just so damn satisfied. I'll be a stay-at-home mom because we read a book on child rearing that says stability is the most important factor in our child's success. I said, you're jumping the gun a little bit, aren't you? Jumping the gun, she said. Jumping the gun? What does that even mean? On the morning commute to work, I wore my earbuds and listened to prog rock and pretended that everyone on the subway was a part of the same crescendo of feeling. Like there were tendrils of positivity that reached outward from me and drew in one soul after another into this collective story of ever increasing love and beauty. I smiled at strangers and they didn't exactly smile back, but communicated with their eyes that they knew they were a part of this organism too. I drummed on the knees of my khakis and anticipated the first sip of generic brand coffee from the break room that was awaiting me at 201 East Broadway. This was 2003. Fears about Y2K and 9-11 were still fresh and everyone was worried about the escalating war in Iraq. It's true, I was a receptionist, but the company I worked for was a well-funded dot-com where you could hardly tell the difference between the 22-year-old behind the desk and the 22-year-old in the corner office. Jason, the male handler, was almost 30, but he was the most rejuvenile of us all. He effortlessly delivered mail on his skateboard. He had once been a top national skateboarder, or so he told everyone. I was fortunate, I thought, to have a view of the glass walls and doors that looked out upon the marble hallway marred only by the backward letters spelling out madstar.com. I could greet everyone as they showed up for work in the morning and say goodnight on their way out the door. This appealed to my social nature. I would have suffocated in the cubicle maze deeper within the office from lack of space and lack of human contact. This was before the open office model caught on and despite their MBA talk about game changing and disruptive technologies, 
Matt Starr's offices looked much like offices had since the 1980s. The day started out like any other Wednesday. Steady calls right when it hit 9 a.m., which tapered off toward lunchtime. Then a bitch session with Linda, the efficiency expert who was also maintaining a long distance relationship with her SO and spent a lot of time pining after one particular person living far, far away, despite living in a city of 8 million people. I had a vending machine sandwich for lunch, which I know is the saddest possible lunch, but in retrospect was the most appropriate meal I could have eaten that day. When I got back to my desk afterward, I shook the mouse on the mouse pad to make my orange iMac come to life. I had a habit of checking music news and reviews when things were slow, and everybody was still talking about Radiohead's Hail to the Thief, comparing it to OK Computer and Kid A and wondering whether the era of electronic rock was officially over. Then I saw a minor news item, not even linked to from the main page that said Elliot Smith had committed suicide. Holy shit, I said, just as a couple of associates were walking in the door. Elliot Smith, dead? The associates ambled past without responding. Now, I don't know whether you kids know or care who Elliot Smith was, but just imagine your favorite musician and then imagine that that musician is also your favorite uncle. That's what it felt like. This is all to explain why I began to openly weep in the office on the morning of October 22nd, 2003. I won't make excuses. Deep inside me, this was probably all about missing Dodger and had nothing to do with the untimely death of the great Elliot Smith. But the immediate consequence was that Asher Eberle, the CEO himself, came out to my desk and asked me what was going on. I told him through a blur of tears that Elliot Smith had died. His overall demeanor showed concern and I don't know if anyone else would have picked up on it. It was only a micro expression, but he actually smirked. Then he sent me home for the day. In retrospect, I should never have gone back. That smirk said all that needed to be said about my future there. Thursday was awkward, full of complicated knowing looks. Some people raised their eyebrows at me in greeting instead of saying hello, others ignored me. When I came in on Friday though, I noticed all my coworkers wore their wet hair swept to the left with collared shirts buttoned to the top covered by a v-neck. They wore cheap bead bracelets and metal design rings. They even went so far as to buy matching Ankh necklaces like the character of Death from Sandman comics. That was my look they were mocking. I never even realized I had a look until that day. Listen, I've been made fun of before. It's never fun. But when you are a grown man who thinks he's passed his worst years of bullying, there's an extra sting to the bruise when you realize that you are the butt of the joke in the office. Jason handed me a parcel as he skateboarded by. Package for Emo Eddie, said Jason, who to his credit did not participate in the dress code, but who apparently coined the nickname for which he seemed quite proud. Inside the package was a frame cut out from a teeny bopper magazine featuring Robert Smith from The Cure. The office had really gone all out to make me feel like a raw nerve. In their minds, perhaps, they were curing me of my oversensitivity. That night, I sat on my blue-green sofa that sank in the middle, and I stared at the pile of bills on the table. Could I afford to quit my job? Weren't there plenty of jobs in the city? I picked up my Nokia and rang Dodger, not intending for her to comfort me, but feeling comforted by calling her nonetheless. You're right. I said, aware of the self-pity in my voice, but helped us to stop it. People are pretty much shit. What are you talking about? Said Dodger. I'm talking about the way I always pretend like everything's cool, but everything isn't cool. The siren outside became so loud that even if she had been speaking, I would not have been able to hear her. That city is breaking you, Dodger said. Get the hell out. It's not, I'm, I'm not. I just realized that everything you've been saying is true. Please, said Dodger. I need you to be you right now. Is that what you need? What about what I need? How's that for honesty? What does Emo Eddie need? Eddie, what do you need? I need you to come to New York and be with me, whether it's for the weekend or forever. I just need you right now. I can't do that. Of course you can. I literally can't. You literally can, I said, and you have to. I will buy you a ticket and send it to you. So unless you wanna waste money, she sighed a sigh. It was neither frustrated nor sad exactly, but deeply exhausted. Only for the weekend, she said, only for the weekend. Have you been drinking? No. Well, you should be, she said. And I was so glad that she existed and that she was mine.
That night I dreamt that Dodger and I left everything behind, not just our day jobs, but all our ambitions, our homes, our country, our shitty president and his shitty wars, our whole identities. We just hopped on a train together and found ourselves pouring out into some unknown city. It was liberating, just fading into some foreign crowd, a former barista and receptionist, a former aspiring scholar and filmmaker, former Americans. And it was exhilarating, not knowing whether we even had the means to survive, just finding it out one meal at a time, as long as it was us. I awoke with a deeply hopeful feeling, one that I hadn't felt in a long time. Maybe I should thank my coworkers, I thought, for clarifying things. It was early Saturday morning, still dark. And even though I'm not a smoker, I keep a pack around the house for days when I need to feel like a movie star. I opened a window and sat beside it full of apprehensions for what could be. Grand Central Station is a great people watching place as any New Yorker could tell you. The abundance and variety of human life is on full display within its buttressed dome. As I watched the passers by that Saturday afternoon, I kept accumulating little gems to share with Dodger when she arrived. Tiny observations about the way a mother seemed to react with almost comical fear to her twin son's antics, or the way a country couple stumbled hesitantly out of their train car, or the way a hunched and hairy troll of a man stood unselfconsciously underneath a fresh graffito that read, fuck hobbits. The last of the Lord of the Rings trilogy was just about to be released in theaters. I imagine myself as a camera, recording and fixing into film everything that came under my gaze at 24 frames per second. Small gestures and expressions became suddenly meaningful. Anonymous others were now actors dramatizing the narrative of their own secret lives. But after 15 minutes, 20, 45 had passed and the day became darker and no face I recognized materialized that of the crowd. Ezra Pound's poem bubbled up into my consciousness a poem that Dodger and I first encountered in a Western Civ class by a professor who condemned the author of the poem as a traitor and a fascist. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. As I stood there waiting by the kiosk in Grand Central Station, I saw as though for the first time the apparition of faces, the innumerable and interchangeable strangeness of strangers. It felt like nothing so much as a nature documentary in which walruses or baboons can be differentiated only by relative size, unique markings, coloration, or age, but seemed to have no individuality that a human can distinguish. They could indeed have been petals on a wet black bough. But this revelation was not pretty, the way I thought the poem was intended to be when I first read it. The anonymity of this flowering branch was grotesque. It sickened me. I called Dodger, and she didn't answer, then called again to leave a message, then called a third time just in case. Each time the voicemail message picked up, I thought for sure it was her real live voice and I was addicted to that brief hope. Finally, I fled the scene, defeated, wrecked, crawling back to my studio apartment like the very cockroaches that infested it. Mothers of ancient Greek soldiers were said to have cried out to their parting sons, come back with your shield or on it. That night, as I passed on to sleep, I felt very much like a vanquished Greek who had lost his glory and came home shieldless. But that was not my lowest point. That came in the middle of the night when my mother called. The familiar ring and buzz of the Nokia on the side table. In the confusion of my dream, I thought I was a Greek soldier and my mother was calling to express her great shame at my defeat. But she had other news. Dodger, my Angelino, my dark blossom, had died that night of the same affliction as Elliot Smith, except she had taken a gun, where she'd gotten a gun, and placed it to her temple. Who knows for how long she had stood there, second guessing, making excuses, trying to weigh the merits of pain and nothingness, and simply pulled the trigger. I kept on imagining the moment of the gun firing and I kept mentally trying to stop it. I was in this mental loop, this pattern that it felt impossible to disrupt. Click, point, stop, boom. Click, point, stop, boom. Click, point, stop, boom. Standing there in the dark, in the kitchen, my eyes intent on the reel of my imagination, I held onto the refrigerator handle in case I should lose my legs beneath me. Never had I felt so disgusted with myself than at that moment, for I realized I was picturing her death in cinematic terms, the triangular composition of the shot, the backlighting to make her appeal, appeal, appear more holy and dark, 
the pan and zoom to make the audience feel a part of the whole scene. I hit myself in the temple as hard as I could, but it's not very hard. And then again, to exorcise the constant aesthetic eye that persisted in its attempts to translate my fresh grief into palatable beauty. Dodger's suicide devastated me and crushed me, but it didn't surprise me. I had been aware of her depression from the beginning and combined with her ability to look bleakly into the future and anticipate death, she was only jumping the gun on the inevitable. Jumping the gun, I thought, with a morbid laugh. The rest of the subway car was glancing at me through their peripheral vision, the laughing weirdo with the mascara and the jewelry, assessing me as a potential threat or concern. I had taken a new job as an artist's assistant, and the artist in question was a tyrant when it came to punctuality except for his own. It would be another five years before I realized that New York City had its fill of me, and I followed a girl named Ollie to South Carolina where she was from, and where all she ever wanted to do was be a librarian, and I figured I would be just fine as a teacher. I had come to the conclusion then that my feelings were indulgences, luxuries rather than necessities. To Dodger, perhaps pain was keen and real, but for me, it was an ornament. I resolved forever to treat myself and others with the kind of harshness that Dodger expected. Disillusionment was too painful. Better to live on a plateau of feeling. Better not to aspire to happiness in the first place. Which brings us to today, with me assigning you this essay and reminding you that there will be no credit for late papers and that your paper must contain regular fonts and margins and it must have numbered pages. It must be 12 to 15 pages long and I must attempt to wrestle with the themes and motifs in the poem under discussion, all while comparing it to your own unique, irreducible, unrepeatable life. Thank you. Happy to take any questions if anybody has them. Thanks, Fong. That was excellent. I have a lot of questions. I have several questions. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I wonder though, and this, and th I'll, I'll give you this one just to think about for a minute. Yeah. Cause I would love to hear, I'm now obsessed with the idea of the artistic statement. Yeah. And so I would love, and I know I'm putting you on the spot with that. So if you could yeah, just exactly. think about if you could, what would be your artistic statement for this piece? And if you're ready for that now, go ahead and talk about it. If you're not, I'll ask you- Join the meeting. Question. Uh, sure. I, I think, um, you know, the, the origin, as far as I'm concerned, of the emphasis upon effects, especially in the short story, comes from Edgar Allan Poe, right? And the single effect in the prose tale. And, um, and when he talks about single effects, you know, be, Poe being Poe is talking about something somewhat simple, which is, you know, to make somebody laugh or cry or fear or, you know, have, having some kind of um, visceral human response. And um, so what I hope the poem does is have the, a kind of pendulum swing of emotion from, um, you know, the from, you know, funny, to sad and, you know, back and forth. Um, so I, I was I'm, in this particular story working with uh, in terms of effects upon a reader, uh, 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 something, a premise which is somewhat simple. Right. Um, it complex emotionally, but still trying to uh, register emotion more so than intellectual response. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, on the spot, the best I can devise for that. It's good. All right. Thank you. I'm going to ask you, I, I want to ask you, because you began your discussion talking about um, research, which I also love as a fiction writer because it's so comforting to be able to go to it. And like you, I also worry about it sometimes. And like you, I also go to history often. Um, I wonder, and I like to talk about research and dream and life. I think that I like, I always love that dream element too. Could you talk a little bit about how research, how the research informed this particular piece? What was the research? How much time did you spend on it? And when did you get, when did you not use it or when did you go beyond it? Yeah, it's it's funny because, um, you know, Senior Skip Day is my sort of least research heavy project, right? I mean, I've got the upcoming book, Bronze Drum, which is set in 40 AD in ancient Vietnam in the Bronze Age. And there's just so much research went into writing that book. And then the, the um, 
uh, Joe Harper book is set in, you know, the 1880 in, um, you know, uh, in, in Missouri and then the, the Western United States. But um, so, and, and about hobo culture, and there's a lot of research that went into that. So, I, you know, the, whatever research I may have done for Senior Skip Day, it, it doesn't feel like research in, by comparison to those other projects. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think if there was, if, if this particular um, uh, story involved research. Well, I guess I, you know, I wanted to get I, my facts about New York City right in terms of like the, uh, you know, the L train and um, uh, and where he would, where, what office he would work, what neighborhood in Brooklyn he lived in and things like that. I grew up outside of New York, but I, I kind of hated going into New York as a kid. It was for, maybe for the reasons that um, the, you know, Eddie, the character talks about in there is you feel very anonymous in that city. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I, even though I grew up near it and would go into the city, you know, every now and then as a kid, I'm not very familiar with its geography. So I needed to get a lot of that, those details right. Um, and uh, what else as far as research? Um, well, you know, it's an interesting part of this particular project is that there are um, canonical, canonical, like uh, literary traditions to the discussions surrounding certain poems. And, um, and, and so being aware of that, even if the, the, the high school age writers who are uh, writing these uh, essays uh, aren't aware of that tradition, I want to be aware of that tradition of interpretation so that it'll be something extra and something interesting for um, readers who do know uh, the way that these uh, works have been discussed um, by literary study. So those are some of the ways that the research found its way into this project, but, uh, but it really didn't feel like research by comparison. Was that news release about Elliot Smith, was that printed in the story? Uh, no, that, that was just uh, something I found to, to share with you all in this uh, uh, PowerPoint format. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Other questions? Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on form and how you form and structure and how you came to the structure of, of these essays and essay prompt for um, Senior Skip Day. Um, so I've always loved hermit crab stories, you know, stories written in the voice of some other genre other than a story, you know, and you know, for example, um, Lori Moore's self-help, you know, is the, the, all the stories are written the kind of the self-help mode and, um, and, and, you know, hermit crab essays, hermit crab poems and things like that. So um, I ha have always written some stories in the voice of other genres. This particular collection, I would say that there are two source of inspiration. One is a story by Eric Puckner called uh, Essay Number Three, Lita and the Swan. Um, and another is by uh, Scott Garson. Um, and that's in his collection, Is That You, John Wayne? And um, so uh, it's, it's not, it's certainly not the first, um, you know, none of these are the first stories that are written in the voice of high school essays. Um, but uh, but I had a lot of fun with this uh, form and um, uh, and and so yeah my my general interest in hermit crab stories led to the very specific interest in uh, writing from the point of view of high school characters and if you uh, you know if anybody's read or even read a description of Joe Harper you know that I'm interested in that kind of territory of um, um, you know, a, a kind of naive perspective. Yeah. This is just a comment. Have you read um, Kevin McElvoy's The Complete History of New Mexico? I have it's, not. Okay, no. it's also a, a, a student paper. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's the, it's the title of the book too. So it's the title story. So it's easy to find. Wonderful, thank you. And you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that Josh about form because I thought the form was really cool. and and. 
I also, I mean, to come up with, to find the form that can shape the book is such a beautiful thing. And then we get to see the writer at play, you know, so the writer gets to play all over the place with this. How, how many stories are, are in the book, Far? Uh, I think 14. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I love the move you made at the end of this piece, which was the, the, the kind of final formal move, which is to directly address the, the uh, students. And this is also just a comment, but I love that we that you you were able to make that move, which was somehow so, um, it became, it, it was kind of intimate, but it was also really sterile. There was something just horrible about that move. I thought after we had this incredible intimacy in this character's life, so the, the, the narrator was able to reveal himself in a way to these students and then pulls back into this mode of the teacher and getting into this, you know, kind of bullshit, not just assignment language, which, which was an interesting way for me to close the piece in an almost cold, icy way, which that was really cool. I, I'd say, you know, everything I know as a writer, I learned from Mark Twain. And um, uh, I, I feel like for some readers, uh, Huckleberry Finn is not an emotional experience. For me, it's a deeply emotional experience reading that book. And um, uh, one of the most powerful moments for me is when he simply, his, his friend Buck dies, um, uh, Buck uh, Grangerford, and he, he says, and then I you know, closed his eyes and um, cried a little bit because he was mighty good to me, right? And it's just a very simple, like, I just did what I had to do, closed his eyes, cried a little bit, and moved on. Um, there's something about when a character refuses to experience the emotion that they ought to be experiencing at that moment, that the, the reader takes that motion, emotion on for themselves. So it's, it's to be contrasted with the way emotion works in screen media, where whenever, when the character is in a paroxysm of weeping and grief, that's when it's the peak emotional moment for the viewer, as well as for the, the, um, the character. But I think it works almost in the opposite way in literature, where there are conditions that they ought to be feeling, but they are not. And that's when we as readers take that on. And, uh, you know, so it, again, in, in Huck Finn in the beginning, when his uh, father's just chasing him around with the, the corn knife and, and he, until he falls unconscious, drunk, and he has to stay up all night pointing the shotgun at his father just in case he wakes up and tries to kill him. But it's told in this very matter of fact way but it's a really powerful, you know, deeply affecting kind of scene, despite how, um, you know, the cadence and the, um, the, the neutrality of that voice. So that is something that I'm uh, aware of and, and sort of deliberately working with in my stories. Now, I mean, I also think it reveals, I think it's a big move in what it reveals about our narrator too. The fact that this is where he goes with this um, intimacy, you know, which is into an assignment with students that he knows, but, you know, they're, they're not with him. And he's he telling this incredibly intimate story. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, that tells us about his life outside of that story and, you know, outside of the assignment in a really cool way. And, and I'm thinking just in terms of his isolation or maybe loneliness or lack of intimacy. Yeah, um, when it comes to hermit crab stories and I assign them a lot, it's um, it, it, whenever the, the believability of the form comes in conflict with the necessities of storytelling, I say, let the believability fall away and just do the storytelling. And uh, for, uh, that's how it works for me as a reader. I may, it may not work that way for everyone, but if I'm reading something and uh, the voice isn't, oh, this isn't the voice of a high school essay. This isn't the voice of a self-help book um, exactly. Uh, that doesn't bother me nearly as much as somebody not telling a story, right? And so um, uh, what, what one has to do in a hermit crab story is let that um, voice fall away at times and have the story take over. And um, so uh, I think that's, uh, that's partly to explain uh, why that is the way that it is. And all the, all the stories do that in this collection. They all tell stories as opposed to being, you know, very um, convincing examples of high school essays. So there's a moment in this that, um, <clears throat> and it's when you show the picture of the, of the train station and the, and the people in the black and white photo. Um, and there's a really lyric moment. And I just wondered, 
to what extent, and, and it's cool because there's so many different modes of storytelling in this. There's this kind of direct storytelling, there's this deep emotional resonance, and then there's the humor undercutting everything. Um, and I just wonder though about that lyric element because you've got a whole book of stories based on poems. Um, what did, how was that for you? What, what drew you to, to, to doing that? And how did, how did you feel that it worked? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave aside for the moment how I think it worked and, and speak to sort of my reasons for including it and why I, um, why that is the way that it is. I think um, this was, in addition to being the last story in the collection, the last story that I wrote for this collection. Um, and uh, there, because of that, that naive perspective that I'm using in, for most of these kids who are writing these um, essay slash stories, um, it doesn't afford many moments uh, where you can sort of fall into the lyricism. And um, so, uh, and that's something that I enjoy as a reader. And so um, it was kind of cathartic to include. And um, I, I think the, the, any further explanation is, is rather mundane, which is that every subsequent time I re read it, I, that I never cut it, right? And so, um, that, that means that it was, it, it was good to my eye, you know. And I guess I meant operate rather than work. I wasn't, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Um, other questions? Yeah, actually, um, could you talk a little bit as to, um, how you came about like just selecting the, the, the poem in question and, and what your, um, uh, I guess, how you intended to write around that um, and include that um, in, in the story and, and kind of, I guess, which came first for you um, as you were kind of thinking this, this piece up? Yeah, um, so uh, partly it has to do with um, teaching the American literature survey course semester after semester after semester, year after year, you know, decade of that. And um, knowing the Norton American literature anthology backwards and forwards, and, um, and then, you know, wanting to do something with those interpretations, but not being a, a, a literary scholar by training, right? Um, that I, it, the, my response is a fictional response, right? And um, so it, it, it did, and in each of these cases, begin with the poems themselves, though usually it's sort of, it's more playful than this, right? Um, I'm, I'm tempted to give an example from one of the, just like a paragraph or two from, do you, would you mind if I did that? Give an example. Um, so, uh, let me conjure it up on my desktop here. So here's uh, the, the, the first one is on Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken by Matt Carolla. And it begins, the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost is about a guy who gets lost in the woods. Robert Frost lived in a time before GPS and there was no way he could have known where the roads would take him without actually walking down them. So he writes a poem about it. In this paper, I will argue that Mr. Frost had a difficult time making a choice because he wasn't used to choosing between different options the way we are today. So, you know, this, this um, uh, that, that kind of playful, naive perspective is something that I had a lot of fun with throughout, but in, in it, I can also embed um, uh, a maybe incipient, but still apt criticisms and um, analyses from the points of view of these kids who have their own life experiences that they can relate to some part of the poem, even if they misunderstand or even if they um, are, uh, you know, at first taking the most obvious version of the, the poem, that they're able to do something with it by relating it to their life experience that um, informs that life experience and informs the understanding of the poem. So. Um, Mostly, that's what I found myself doing, of course, in the in the fictional format. Um, and uh, I think the only difference with uh, prompt for final essay is that um, he's uh, he's modeling it. He's not just uh, stumbling into that. 
um, but it's something that he has control of as a narrator. Fong, did any of the students um, write poems themselves or lapse into the voices or try to lapse into the voices of the poets in question? Any of the, the fictional students in the collection? Yeah. Um, so let me think about that. They, they fall into the voice of the poet. Um, uh, I'm going to say no. Um, I, I'm trying to think about all 14 stories and whether or not that happens. They, they certainly don't write in, um, in with lineation. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll share another example just because I get a kick out of my own work. So I apologize, but just another short example. This is um, uh, on, on Carlos Williams, The Red Wheelbarrow by Rosa Gutierrez. In olden times, people depended on wheelbarrows and chickens. In his poem, The Red Wheelbarrow, Carlos writes about the way things were when he was alive. In this essay, I will argue that when he wrote this poem, Carlos was tired and thirsty, which is why he wrote such a short poem. Um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, they, 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 aren't, they aren't necessarily doing the most like uh, forward and sophisticated analyses, but they stumble into it because they're, they wind up telling about their own experiences. And, um, you know, I, I, I you know, won't read a whole one, but you can find them published in various places, not yet as a collection, but, um, uh, but yeah, they, they kind of back into it. That's really fun. Um, I, and I, I would love, I mean, I, I think it'd be really fun to do that kind of project. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. And, um, the, uh, I will say that, um, uh, it's, unlikely to be published as a collection soon because i my my agent who whom i love doesn't represent short story collections only novels right and, uh, so i'm in this weird situation where each of my contracts says you know uh, the they they get first right of the publisher gets first right of refusal for my next project but my next but he won't send them the short story collection so i have to do something different, you know, but I, I, all the individual stories, almost all the individual stories are out there, you know, published somewhere or another. So. Um, Fong, I have another question about this story. Um, you know, I, if, if I have something like a suicide in a story, it makes me really nervous. And yeah. I was wondering how you, how you kind of, um, thought about the reveal where you were going to put that how you know how you placed it and what your concerns were about and sort of how you dealt with those concerns yeah um so uh, i'll say a couple of things there one is that i meant to give a content warning and i forgot and i apologize if that that uh, has any effect on anybody but um in terms of including a uh, a suicide or, or including anything that would be challenging to a reader um my advice which i take for myself as well is not to write defensively so you don't write with the mind like oh what if this person will read it? and what if this person will read it but when it comes to you know uh the finished draft and putting it out there in the world and publishing it then you can kind of ask those questions but while writing it i didn't uh pose that question while editing it i did you know and um so uh, mostly my concern as I edited it was that um, I wanted only through dialogue for uh, her character to be understood well enough to have um, for that to be convincing and not just come out of nowhere, right? Um, so the things that she says uh, for it to be like, Oh, okay. Well, she she kept on saying, "Well, I need you to be you, and I want I like your enthusiasm. Don't let the city make you cynical. You have to. You need to be there for me, right?" And um, so, uh, so yeah, my my focus was trying to um, make it so that Dodger was convincing, and um, that uh, when it arose, that you know, I mean, there are certain things that I think are uh, emotionally manipulative in a story like a, a dying child, you know? Um, 
and um, I tried not to make it that, you know, if it, if it, if it feels that way, then I failed at that, but I, uh, it's, it, it made sense for this character and it made sense for the story. And um, even though the, the intended effect is that kind of pendulum swing and then that, um, you know, that, that emotional pull, um, I, I didn't want it to, to be cheap or to feel cheap. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's. Yeah, that would be my concern too. And I don't think it did feel cheap when it came up. I was surprised, but I wasn't, I mean, I, I, and I was interested. I was surprised because it was fairly late in the story, but, it, but we, we had the Elliot Smith before that. We had certain things going on tonally and in terms of mood and gravity. So I went, and, and, and then you were late, your, your hand was light on it, you know, but, but I would have had anxiety like you about, is this too much? Am I, you know, we talked about emotional manipulation or am I going for something sensational with this? Yeah. And that's why I, th I admired your light hand. Yeah, I think uh, w one thing that, um, is an advantage of writing projects that are so disparate is that um, I allow myself to, um, to I allow myself a certain amount of extremity, you know, um, that I might not otherwise if I were working and trying to make the 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 the, the perfect pottery, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like I, I I'm not just kind of repeating. The same form over and over again. And when I say that, I don't say that dismissively. I say that knowing that some great artists, um, you know, you know, like a, a Degas or something, paints the same thing over and over and over again. Um, but that's not what I do, and that's not what I what appeals to me about fiction writing. It's the the diversity and variety of voices and experiences that that appeal to me. So um, I think one of the things that 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 leads to and, and is an advantage is that I. I, I, I don't feel the, um, you know, if, if I go overboard in one area, then there, that there's another area in which I'm doing something very, very different. So um, I don't feel like, oh, that makes me that type of writer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I, and I didn't think you did go overboard. I think, and I think, I mean, I think that, that that's absolutely crucial to the story, you know, obviously. And, and that's what I think also makes, what makes the end so powerful? Hmm. Um, other questions? Polly, thanks for putting the um, title in the chat there. I hope this isn't too broad of a question, but I'd love to hear about your revision process and how long it usually takes you to revise something and when you know that you're, you know, at least good enough to be yeah. trying to publish it. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's it's definitely different for a short story than it is for a novel. They're a completely different um, beasts as far as revision goes. Uh, with a story, um, I typically will kind of read it over and over and over and over and over again until I practically have memorized it, changing little things and eventually major things get changed. And the point at which it's just ready is usually a point at which my, you know, read through and edit is like, I'll remove a comma and then I'll go back and put in that comma, you know, again, then, then, then I'm like, okay, I'm really just playing with the uh, minutia here and it's otherwise good to my eye, you know? Um, but with a novel, um, I discovered early on that I couldn't edit that way because it would take forever, you know, you to read through the whole novel, changing little things and read through the whole novel again, changing little things and keep on doing that. Um, so I had to write in discrete drafts with very specific um, strategies in mind. So if I went through with this draft, I need to make this character uh, more fleshed out, or I need to bring the conflict up earlier into the book, or you know th those kinds of uh, very specific uh, targets for the editing, and I needed to actually write them down so that I could refer to them as I'm going through um that draft of the novel so i have discrete drafts that i save draft one draft two draft three etc which is not the way that i edit for a short story i just keep on changing it every time i read it um so that's not prescriptive i'm not saying that's the way to um edit a story or edit a novel but for me that that, that is the the real difference and um the indication that it's it's ready 
and, and, and as far as a novel is concerned, uh, the indication that it's ready, boy, there's a huge gap between what I, when I think it's ready and when the editors think it's ready. So, um, you know, uh, I, I have to do the best I can and then trust the process. That's a great answer. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Is there a last question? Ong, I'm uh, curious on just a little bit of um, your initial thoughts and, and, you know, kind of genesis of this in terms of, uh, did this start with a, a single story or two? Was this viewed as, you know, you sit down knowing I'm, I'm looking at um, a collection that's going to be linked? Um, how is that kind of process of putting these together? Uh, how, how'd that go for you? Um, yeah, it, uh, it started with a single story. Um, it started actually with the, uh, the red wheelbarrow story that I read the first paragraph of, um, I just, I, I, I got such a kick out of this idea of this, uh, student thinking that it's, you know, uh, that it's, that, you know, Carlos, uh, William Carlos Williams is, is writing about, uh, when he was alive and, you know, writing about chickens because, and, and, and rain because he's thirsty and chickens because he's hungry and, you know, putting in these very animalistic terms. Um, so, uh, it's just, you know, an idea I got a kick out of, I wrote, I think I probably wrote the first draft of that story on Martha's Vineyard. I often start new projects when I teach in Martha's Vineyard in the summer. And, um, I think that's where I wrote that one. And, um, uh, it was I, the, the only sort of conscious thought about the process other than, Ooh, I'll, I'll get a kick out of this is, um, I want to start something new and I want to move in a completely different direction than other things that I've been working on, which is true of that story. All right. We are out of time. Fong, thank you for the reading. It was fantastic. Thank you for illuminating discussion. Thank you for the workshop. And we, it was great having you here. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. You all are wonderful. Thank you. We'll do it again someday when we can actually bring you here. Look forward to it. All right, everyone. Thank you. Good night. I know there's a voiceover tonight at eight o'clock. Have fun.